name is Jim. This is my podcast, The Bloody Vegans. You're very welcome to it. Each week, I'll be traveling ever deeper into the world of veganism, discovering along the way a multitude of viewpoints from the political and ethical to the practical. I'll be doing this through a series of conversations, each aiming to further illuminate my understanding and hopefully yours of all things plant-centric. And this week's no different. I'm going to be speaking to Curtis Malick, one of the uh, top 150 squash players in the world, uh, European under-19 champion. Uh, he's won a won a couple of accolades already in his uh, in his relatively short professional career, but he is an absolute rising star in the game, uh, and has really embraced uh, a plant based diet and all things vegan. So, without further ado, here's a conversation between myself and Curtis Malik. Good to kick off then, Curtis, with a bit of your your kind of personal journey into the world of veganism. How did you get here? It was kind of a, t- a tough start. So my youngest brother had a got a brain tumour, and at the time, I uh, decided to start looking into ways to kind of help combat cancer and tumours and stuff like that. And the biggest thing that kind of come across to me was cutting out dairy. So I, I actually cut out dairy first. So I removed all that cheese, egg, cheese, milk, and eggs. And then one thing led to another, and like maybe like a few weeks later, I then kind of went, I, I did the whole package, I went all vegan, so cut out meat, fish, and everything else. And at the same time, my little brother did it as well, and then my whole family did it. So I've got five other siblings who are also all vegan. So that's that's basically how it started, and... For me, the, the easiest way for me to like study it was I read the How Not to Die book by Dr. Greger, if you know, if you know. Yeah, and that for me that that book was really like informational and like it gave me a lot to uh, kind of base my diet around once I went vegan, because I I had a good understanding of nutrition as it was, but it was just kind of like changing out protein here and there what to eat what not to eat and things like that was there a kind of driving force a a, a guiding hand maybe somebody leading you towards that was this kind of your own research was there kind of medical professionals involved how did you get involved in it from that angle that's that's a good question uh honestly I i was doing some research by myself but then out of the blue one day i was at my kind of training center at the squash club i was sitting in the sauna uh, and I was sat, sat with this other, there's another guy in there and he, was, he started talking to me about veganism and I was, he was just talking about it, explaining like about Dr. Gregor, how, how it's obviously like how it reverses heart disease, it can reverse certain cancers and all that. And I, just, I sat there listening, went back home that evening, did, did, did a lot of research, ordered the book and basically from there, that next day, I went vegan. I mean that that that's that's an incredible switch and one yeah. that you that you you very rarely hear most people kind of uh, take some time to to get into it. Was when you started to kind of talk about this with your family, you know that you'd met this guy, you know down at the squash club etc. Uh-huh. and he and he told you this and then you got like, you've got this book, you've picked it up and you, and you're going to make this switch like especially you know coming from a a big family, I'd imagine who weren't who weren't on the same journey as you initially what was the initial response like it was actually like it was super positive because like my mum obviously like cooked for the whole family and then and my mum and dad obviously cooked for the whole family but I, I told my mum and she's like yeah that's fine and I then I, I kind of like started saying like what needs to be substituted here and there and then maybe like a week or two later the rest of my siblings jumped on board and were kind of happy enough to do it. They were happy enough to experiment out and see what, see what it was like. And that's how it kind of progressed from there, to be honest with you. It's sure, so kind of like a, a, a collective family experiment. Yeah, yeah. And and was, was it a bit of a tough learning curve for you all? Did was, it, was there kind of a bit of procrastination, perhaps a bit of rejection at certain points from, from individuals? Or did everyone kind of see the benefits at the same time? Honestly, like... There was no negativity towards it. We were we were all fully on board with it because 
I'd, I'd, I'd shown the research, I'd found out, I'd shown like the benefits, and like they, they were they got on board pretty quickly about any kind of argu arguments, to be honest with you. Do you, do you think that the family kind of were were really, I guess, rallying round uh, the idea of you know this this diet as a as a way to help your brother uh, to combat uh, this this you know very severe illness? I, I I would agree on that. That's probably one of the main reasons why they all jumped on board so well as well because of that. So like if if we kind of just left him to the kind of the plant based side on his own and then us still eating like meat and stuff and here and there. It, it would kind of make us feel bad, but then when we're doing it with him, it made him feel as part of still as part of the family, and that brought it in the same. It didn't it didn't matter then. You know, with the medical professionals who were who were supporting him at the time, was there any scepticism from them? You know, when you'd kind of collectively said, you know, this is something we'd like to try. We think it's going to impact, or did they kind of see the benefits and you know straight away and say, you know, that's a good choice? I think the doctors understood why we did it but i always think that doctors and they, they never really kind of advise that you do that because it's it's against what they've been taught i think so i think they accepted it but weren't keen on him doing it but it, it turned out for the better that he actually survived a lot longer than what they predicted him to survive for? Yeah, I, I I can understand, you know, from from a medical professional's point of view that, you know, having spoken to a, a few on the podcast and, you know, particularly recently, that there's very little training from a nutritional standpoint in a traditional doctor's kind of education. You know, there's a lot of other wonderful, you know, aspects of it, obviously, and no disservice to any doctors out there, but the, the nutrition is obviously some, is usually something that they have to kind of almost go on their own journey with so you know it sounds like that aligns with with your experience you know and and them taking care of your of your of your brother when you you know you you were on this journey i suppose of um you know getting into your sport as well at the uh, i guess along the same path you know when did your journey into kind of squash and you know ultimately kind of the the level that you're at now where did that begin and cross over with with plant-based diets and, and ultimately veganism yeah, that's that's a good question. Uh, so I've been vegan for just over two years now. April 2018, I went vegan. And it was around that time, maybe in June, that I decided to turn professional from juniors. So for me, it was also not just as a lifestyle of going vegan for like health, but it was also I did it for, for my sport to see if I see if it would help see what gains I could create and make. And over time, for that first few months, I actually, my, my body fat dropped significantly, which I can never properly do in for like, maybe like a year or two properly. And then, then I find that I've, I've been recovering slightly quicker after matches and training sessions, being able to go harder again the next day. And it was, it was a really, really positive first few weeks for me. So then I just I jumped on board and obviously continued it until now and I'm just loving it. That's awesome. Did you have to kind of do a, a fair amount of adaptation or, uh, or or learning, I guess, in terms of the specific diets? Because I mean, you know, as you as you, I'm sure you're well aware. You know, when you go into plant based diets and and vegan living, you can. Um, you can come a cropper quite easily, you know. It's, it's like with any diet, really. It's, it's quite easily to easy to eat unhealthily. We did you find you had to kind of school yourself quite specifically in nutrition for sport? And what were the kind of resources that you that you looked to to do that research if that was a route you went down? Yeah. So for me, when I went first went vegan, it was whole foods, plant based. So no, no junk food no uh, kind of processed foods that was the idea because again that's that stuff's linked to cancer isn't it so straight away obviously i read dr Greg's book he has his daily dozen on there which is super super helpful for anyone who's starting out to be vegan kind of start, studied the book then i use the app the app gives you like a daily kind of target allowance uh requirements that you should kind of 
kind of look to eat in terms of like carbohydrates, proteins, like then like nuts, fruits, vegetables, and all that kind of stuff, legumes. Um, so over time, like I I track my kind of the food I was eating on my fitness pal, and then just to make sure I was meeting the right kind of protein requirements as I was before I was vegan. So making sure I'd get enough for like my training and competition and all that. And kind of over time, I'd gradually like kind of refine it. So adding a bit more, say, protein or carbohydrates here and there, a bit more fruit or vegetables than normal. And like before I knew it, I kind of, I kind of hit, hit, the head on, hit the head on the nail and I really got down to a T. So real kind of, you know, personal learning journey then you and, and one of real refinement, I guess, and, and finessing the diet over time. Was there any kind of um, I suppose pitfalls that you fell into, you know, whether it be the vegan junk food bit or were you, you, you were just incredibly strict when it came to the whole foods piece? And, and how's that adapted every time? Have you been able to let up slightly on that or are you you still very much on that whole food plant based kind of um, lifestyle? So I definitely say I'm still on the whole food plant based lifestyle, but kind of over time, especially in the last year or two, like there's been such like a high demand in like like plant alternatives for like like say like meat and stuff, burgers and all that. So like I started experimenting, having a look around like veggie burgers and stuff. I mean I I happily eat veggie burgers, like vegan sausages, like vegan chocolate and all that kind of stuff as well. But it's obviously like in a very limited amount, so. It, enough so I can enjoy it but not not so much that it's going to impact my kind of my performance and health you make a really interesting point there about the you know the the rise in it last few years particularly there's been an explosion hasn't there of yeah. um of products that you know even when you know you started I started there was um there wasn't quite as much and you know I, I only tried to think you know tw- 20 years ago it was very different you know, for for people who were vegan back then, do, do, what's what's your kind of view on it? You know, from from somebody who's really felt the benefits of a whole food plant based diet from a sport, fitness, health point of view, and and you know, seen some uh, seen the effects, I suppose, of um, of the diet on some you know very serious health problems in your family and how positive it can be. Do do you see a sort of a any kind of concerning trend in that in that explosion you know what's your view on it yeah that, that's a that's a good point to be honest uh i do think that the trend is very good at the moment and uh obviously shops are making more and more different kind of plant-based alternatives however you do get a lot of people who turn vegan just because of the animals but then they allow themselves to eat too many of the junk foods and I think that's where it's going to go slightly wrong because you're basically just swapping one bad diet for another. I think if you're going to go plant-based, you've got to kind of inherit that whole foods kind of plant-based mind- mindset. And obviously, I obviously you can eat, eat the junk food here and there, but that shouldn't be in the main bulk of your diet when you first go into it because you're just going to get that those long-term. Uh, there's long-term side effects of it, and it's it's and it's 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 going to cause some some problems for people as well. Do you think there's, you know, for for you personally, you've been on quite a nutritional journey, and it just makes me think, like, you know, for the majority of people, and we talked about, you know, even doctors not having that education. Do do you think there's a, a I suppose a a lack of education nutritionally for for people kind of growing up maybe even in in it maybe even in your world in your sphere as a as a sportsman do you do you think there is a a sufficient amount of knowledge you know in the general populace about what a good diet look, should look like yeah i i think that's that there's a big, big 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 gap between what people are taught and how kind of the the lack of knowledge are actually being being told I don't. I don't think, like you said, cert, obviously certain doctors aren't. They don't get a certain amount of nutrition training, so they're not always going to have the right understanding of what we should and shouldn't eat. And again, when it comes to sports, even like the sports nutritionists can always can also have 
some limited like views and opinions as to what what is right and what isn't. So I, I do I do think there's a gap there. I was going to ask about that actually your your experience with sports nutritionists because you know talking to to Kev last week who's a uh, pro footballer and spoken to a couple of people in that sort of sphere sphere and um, I I was kind of surprised actually by the the probably I guess the lack of embracing of of something like um, a plant based diet, particularly when you know athletes are so often associated with looking for the one percent improvements and you know getting slightly better, you know, because that's the edge over over their competitors at elite levels. I'm sure you experienced that. Like, has it kind of surprised you that the the lack of um, acceptance of it, or do you think people kind of ha- have become more accepting in the last couple of years from your experience i definitely think they've become more accepting in the last couple of years because they can see ways that it can work for people who have gone plant-based but i feel like some of the sports nutritionists or whoever they they kind of have a fixed mindset as to what they've been taught if that's what they've been taught then that can only be the right way to do it and and it's been proven that it isn't so like you can do it another way and actually it's a better way and it's it, it can be hard for people to kind of accept that and change the way they think about it I, and i guess uh, i think it, it probably a, an interesting point and you probably found this in your sport i'm sure but there are many athletes who are succeeding you know so it would be i suppose it would be it's difficult to sort of say well it's the only way to go so i guess there is always going to be a bit of conflict with particularly with nutritionists who've gone through you know most of their careers maybe advising one type of diet that has worked um so there is an element of it working it's just whether it's you know promoting other disease longevity in the in the athlete uh recovery could they be better all those kind of things but to some extent it does work right i guess so mm-hmm. hence why yeah. they still recommend uh, an omnivorous diet yeah it's a it's a it's a tough scenario and like there's still a bit of a, a still a bit of a gap obviously it's closing but obviously a lot more of the top kind of athletes in all kinds of sports you can see like novak djokovic lewis hamilton mike tyson there's, there's a lot to name that that are showing that they can do the same, if not better, on a plant-based diet, and it's it's becoming more and more recognised as a as a kind of as a way of life, really. I mean, how, how close knits the the squash community? I mean, do do a lot of people in your your sphere kind of ask you those kind of questions? You know, like about you know how are you how are you finding it and you know how easy was it to adopt you know is there intrigue interest from within the the sport itself yeah definitely uh like i'll i'll, I'll be away at tournaments or like at team events with some like team players and i'll i'll, I'll always get questions at the dinner table or lunch table saying oh do you not obviously you get the questions like do you miss being do you miss not eating meat do you miss uh all the eggs and like all that kind of stuff, and then this, uh, then the questions are like, is is it is it easy to go vegan? Do you find it hard? And it's I I I give simple answers really, uh, but yeah, I just think they have a again a lack of understanding of what what you actually need to kind of consume. Interesting talking about that being away on uh, tournaments etc. And um, have you? Have you found it hard to kind of have that conversation sometimes when you're you're eating from a quite a limited menu, maybe at a hotel, which wouldn't be what you'd normally eat, but it's perhaps what you have to eat when you're at a tournament, and you you got that sense of this isn't perhaps the best advert for veganism that you have to kind of almost convince them. Have you had that experience? I've had that experience a few times. Uh, for me, the worst time was actually in Argentina. So, as at as at I was in Argentina for a month doing like a four week four week tournaments, four separate tournaments, and literally every tournament I got to the hotel or the local restaurants, they just had like kind of next to nothing in terms of vegan products. They were just meat, dairy, meat, dairy, meat, dairy. So I'd be going out to like eat at night with like some of the other players and stuff, 
and the I'd, I'd be sitting at the menu like trying to just trying to decide what I could have and they'd be looking at my food come out and thinking oh I don't want that <laughs> so this is this is that it can be super hard especially when you're away but for me that's the hardest time uh and that's why for me I've always got to be prepared when I go away to take some extra things here and there and have, have a look do a bit of research before I go out there yeah, that's kind of an interesting point. Because I imagine like your nutrition when you're at a tournament is probably quite specific. You know, you want to be quite um, on point, I guess, with your nutrition. Do, do you find that hard when you're when you're competing, you know, away from home where you haven't got perhaps the, the, the diet around you easily accessible anyway that you would you typically rely on? Yeah, it, it definitely can be hard. Uh, I'm not going to deny that. But again, you kind of got to adapt to the situation and fi find ways of making it work. Kind of sp speak to people because at certain tournaments we can get what's called billeting, so you stay with the like a local family who, who are members of the squash club, and then they can put you up in a house and cook for you and stuff. And at least then you can get give, give them an idea of what you want to make and stuff and eat. But when it doesn't go like that, it can make a little bit of an impact on your performance and like preparation because you haven't got quite what you would have at home in terms of nutrition and preparation is it is it kind of quantity or or quality that you sort of struggle with most when you're in that situation i i'd, I'd say i'd get enough enough food in but but it's the it's the it's the quality of what it comes out as and the the range and diversity of the food that would that compared to what i would eat at home end up with a lot of carb i imagine yeah a lot of carb a lot of, of of salads and then not not as much kind of protein and healthy fats and that, that kind of stuff as someone who's kind of you know tracks uh and certainly tracks you know on your way into the the journey as you were kind of going through that process of discovery was there was there any aspect of of the you know nutrition and particularly nutrition for for sport that you found a little bit perhaps less readily available or, or or perhaps you had to think quite differently about what that nutrition source was. I'll probably go back to protein on that one because a lot of people obviously ask when you go vegan, oh, where do you get protein from? And like, it's actually super simple. Like for me, I just, I never used to eat any types of beans. So like, or tofu. And now like, instead of having like chicken or something in a curry, I'd have like a, a bean type chili or curry just chuck some beans in here and there and then before you know it you, you're kind of meeting the same requirements you already had and like you, you find these you you find these other little things here and there like obviously like peanut butter oats nuts seeds all the, and even vegetables have more protein than you actually think so then you're actually already meeting those requirements and it's actually a lot easier than you think because a lot of people think oh protein oh meat that's their kind of first thought. But you have to actually look at the foods and break it down. Then you're actually getting some really good quality protein from there. And for me, that was a bit of a kind of change the way I thought about it. Yeah, and I suppose one of the huge benefits, right, is you, there's a lot of um, other nutritional benefit to those food sources. It's not just a sort of protein and fat source. It's, you know, often micronutrients in, in some of those food types that you talk of there. Mm, definitely, yeah. There's a lot of micronutrients that a lot of people don't know about as well. And a lot of those vegetables, kind of those whole foods, whole foods have a lot of those micronutrients we need. And a, a lot of people aren't eating enough of those and they're, they're focusing too much on the, on the kind of meat, fish, eggs, dairy side. And I think if pe people made that simple change of looking at whole foods instead, then they'd be a lot more healthier. Just thinking about that from, you know, from your perspective, somebody who's come into the journey for its, you know, holistic kind of health benefits, whether it be in combating preventative from a disease point of view and an, and an illness point of view through to uh, performing at an elite level, you know, various sort of, um, I suppose it's all various points across across a sliding scale of health and fitness, but that was your kind of that was your route in. Do you think um, there's perhaps a, a a real kind of lack of understanding from the 
general public on nutrition that speaks to you know it being these big blocks it's you know and my fitness pal arguably you know something like that and it's obviously an incredibly valuable tool but um where most people probably focus when they have something like that and they're you know perhaps just going to the gym now and then or playing a sport um uh, and perhaps you know working out for the aesthetic or whatever they tend to focus on just the big macros right they don't you know it's the protein carbs etc do you think that's you know almost a bit of a a miss if you like nutritionally speaking when we're talking about real kind of health yeah definitely it's 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 very people overlook a lot of the micronutrients and kind of minerals and vitamins you get within the foods too much and like you said they, they focus on those macronutrients a bit too much as well so there needs to kind of be a balance between knowing what those micronutrients can do for your body and how they're just as useful and impactful as those macronutrients uh yeah it's it's it's, it's a tough area because a lot a lot of people don't really know about it and what the benefits of all those kind of other areas of food are yeah totally i'd, I'd love to sort of you know from that point just pivot into into squash for a second and you know what what got you into squash in the first place is it something you've been you've been doing for a long time and 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 naturally talented at them sort of as soon as you picked it up you know tell us a little bit about that journey into it so i kind of started going on the squash court with my dad and my younger brother around the age of like maybe four or five and that was just like trying to throw balls around the court running around and playing games and then i started playing properly around the age of seven uh, and that was when I first played for Sussex, my county. And around from like the age of like seven to about maybe 15, I was playing kind of all, all, all kind of different sports, like squash, tennis, cricket, rugby, football. But squash was one of my main sport. By the time I was like 11, I was, I was playing for the England under 13 team in squash. And then I kind of won a couple of British national titles throughout the junior age groups and then as soon as I turned 18 really I decided to uh, kind of go full time and take it as a, on as a profession. Incredible like you're just there from such an early age and clearly had a had a talent for it but obviously you've had to work incredibly hard to get to the point you're at and I suppose like you know for, I, I think of sport uh, squash as a hugely participated sport but perhaps um uh, sort of not necessarily the professional side of it being hugely in the public sphere is there certain kind of countries around the world where you, you know there is a is a huge following uh around the sort of professional squash circuit so i'd imagine it would be one of those sports that appeals in in certain territories around the world yeah that's a really good point it squash doesn't have the recognition of something like tennis or kind of football and cricket but there's certain countries that it where it's super popular. So Egypt, for example, their main sports are football and squash. So squash is seen as like their kind of top two sports out there. And at the moment they have four of the world's top players in the top ten in the world. So Egypt are currently kind of powerhouse to squash. And then maybe like twenty, thirty years ago, it was Pakistan. So that was their main sport. They had multiple world winners coming out maybe five in the top 10 in the world as well and that's kind of the kind of main main two areas really at the moment pakistan and now now egypt and where, where does where does sort of england rank in the in the in the world rankings you know are we are we quite up there and 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 do, do we compete purely you know as isolated countries within the united kingdom or is is there also kind of a, a great britain kind of team yeah, so actually England are probably at the moment second best country for squash in the world. And um, we have been for a for a long time we've, and we've been the best maybe for the last five years before the Egyptians kind of came along. And in terms of competing, squash is at the Commonwealth Games, so they uh, they represent as in Team England there and we never get We've never had the chance to compete at the Olympics, so 
We've never been part of the Team GB, so it's always been isolated as just England against other countries in like World Team Championships events and European events, Commonwealth Games. And so, what what's the kind of like ambition for you around around your squash? You know, where where would you like to get to? What what are you targeting? You know, perhaps in the short term and then sort of longer term. So sh- short term for me is uh kind of breaking the top hundred mark in the world rankings within the kind of like next six to eight months. But obviously, because of lockdown, the kind of things have changed. So all tournaments have stopped for the last four months. So it kind of has held that back a little bit. But as soon as it gets up and running again, top hundred is the kind of goal. And then within like a year or a two, top 50 is the goal. And then my, my kind of ultimate goal, kind of goal and dream is obviously to become world number one and world champion. That's, that's they're the end kind of product goals. That's what I'm working towards. Well, best of luck to you. And I'd, I'd imagine the, the trajectory you're on from a nutritional standpoint certainly going to help power that, no doubt. Um, it, it, just so, just for my understanding, I'm just intrigued. So how does how are the world rankings kind of, you know, calculated? You know, what do you have to do? Is it like certain ranked tournaments and ranked matches that you have to play that kind of qualify for improving your ranking? How does it work? So there's... Different, so it's called the Professional Squash Association, the PSA World Tour, and it runs in a similar way to the way the tennis tour does. So, like, you have a certain, there's a certain amount of like tournaments throughout the whole calendar year, and they start at, like a challenger level. So, there's a challenger tournaments, then there's the kind of world kind of series tournaments, which is the equivalent of like the Grand Slams in tennis. So, you have the World Series in squash. And like the challenger tour ranges from like prize funds of up to five thousand to thirty thousand dollars, and then the World Series are obviously much higher than that. Um, for someone like me who's ranked around like the one kind of forty mark, I can get into tournaments in the challenger tour. So you go away to tournaments, say like in Canada, there's like a it's a draw of sixteen players, uh seeded from one to eight of the top eight seeds and you get drawn against one of the top eight seeds and like it's like a knockout stage so each match you win you go through if you lose you, you go out and then whichever round you lose at you get a certain amount of points those points are accumulated over a season you can play up to as many tournaments as you want but 12 and 13 tournaments is like the recommended number you, you do however many points you accumulate in those 12 to 13 tournaments is what will give you your ranking. So everyone else will have accumulated points like that, and then it will see where it paces you, kind of as the each month goes on, because the rankings get updated each month. That 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 kind of tournaments take place. I see. So I guess there's a bit of a balance, right, between wanting to compete in lots of tournaments and give yourself the best shot, and then obviously maintaining your your ability to do that. You know, from a from a health and fitness point of view, right? Uh huh. Definitely. So you have to kind of really think about, you know, how well recovered and rested you are before another tournament. Yeah, that's a that's a good point because traveling takes it out of you. Obviously, both kind of physically and at, and relating back to a nutritional standpoint. So being constantly away and doing too many tournaments is just gonna it's, it's just gonna completely affect your training, your improvement, and your actual outcome of play. So it's finding that balance between picking and choosing the right tournaments to do making sure you're going to perform well at it, obviously get the right nutrition in, get the right recovery work, preparation, before so when you go away you're, you're feeling good. I can imagine that's a, that's a huge challenge. So what, what does the, the kind of like the day-to-day nutrition look like for you, perhaps let's say on the build-up to a tournament, you know, what, what would you typically kind of eat to make sure you're kind of in tip-top con- condition and, and keeping health and, healthy and, uh, and fit? So like day to day for me, I like to always kind of start start with a kind of morning session quite early on, maybe like seven seven a.m. eight a.m. and then then I'll come home and have a bit of have a, have some breakfast. So like I tend to eat like a big bowl of oats with like chia seeds, flax seeds, some cacao powder, some sort of fruit like blueberries, some peanut butter in there, so, and then some vegan protein powder just to boost up a little bit. I'll have that for breakfast and then I'll do another session before lunchtime, come home, kind of eat lunch and 
that that can consist of anything really. It can be like anything like left over from last night, like a bit of a spag bar with some vegan mints with vegetables. It can be like bagels with peanut butter, almond butter on, lots of fruit, lots of like greens and vegetables, nuts and seeds. And then I'll do another session in the afternoon. I come home, eat dinner, it can be it's anything, chickpea curries with rice, kind of potatoes, vegetables with like quinoa, rice or spaghetti. Any types of kind of good quality kind of carbs and good quality protein for when I'm back. Oh, especially like to get some beans in and a lot of vegetables. That's the kind of day to day nutrition for me. Nice and sound, sounds super tasty as well. To be fair, <laughs> some uh, some uh, some of my favourites certainly in there. So, um, in terms of like um, you know, when you're going into a tournament and you're perhaps like you know, it's a it's a heavier workload, a more stressful workload on you. Like, does does it alter much? You know, what what what's the profile look like? Does it change in terms of what what you're eating as well as the quantity of? Yeah. So doesn't normally change what I'm eating but the, the, I'd say the quantity is is increased so I'll, if I'm kind of preparing and building up to it I'd go to training sessions and I'd take like a kind of a good smoothie with me with some good protein and vegetables in there some fruits and yeah it'd just be like an increase in how much I eat at certain meals just to uh, kind of bolster up and feel like I'm energized constantly after each session fits so I'm feeling kind of good and ready to go yeah n- nice would, would you say that there's there's been kind of other squash players who you think of you know perhaps at your local club and where you where you kind of train who've who've followed your lead have you found a, a lot of them kind of asking you you questions about the the diet yeah uh, I've had a few kind of fr- friends here and there at my local squash club who have uh obviously been really interested in what I'm what I'm doing and what I'm eating and even a couple of them have kind of kind of jumped on and jumped on board and gone gone vegan themselves and then there's some kind of sitting on the fence whether to try it or not whether they, whether they think they can do it or not and there's even other kind of squash pros in the, in the top of rankings actually that that are plant-based as well so it's kind of opening up doors to other players to maybe even try it and kind of open their minds to it. Yeah, absolutely. Your, your kind of like go-to recommendation, you know, where, where do you advise them to start? Definitely say start with Dr. Greger's book, do some good research and kind of study what he's kind of learned and stuff because for me that's where I really felt like I was – had had an understanding of what I was eating, and how much to eat, what to eat, and when to eat. Uh, and if they're starting out, I, I, I definitely recommend Dr. Greger, nutritionfacts.org. Really good information on there. So you know, given your given your ambitions, you know where you want to get to in the in the world of in the world of squash. What's what's the kind of uh, the the future hold for you in terms of? Um, uh, tournaments training etc kind of what's coming up what do you need to target and how difficult is it to uh, I guess to to sustain a, a lifestyle in in squash professionally you know is it is it something that at this stage in the UK that you need additional funding for uh, you know secondary incomes etc or, or is it something that you can kind of through sponsorship etc um uh, ultimately devote your your entire time to yeah so unfortunately squash is quite an underpaid sport especially if you're ranked kind of below the kind of 50 mark you're, you're actually going going away to tournaments and kind of struggling to break even in terms of like your cost and winnings so you kind of have to be super careful and conscious about what tournaments you pick to go and do and kind of Bit doing well enough to perform well so that's and then government kind of funding comes into it a lot a lot of the players need government funding and help to be able to kind of support their journey otherwise a lot of players wouldn't kind of have the chance to compete professionally and make it kind of their their job uh, but once you kind of break into that kind of top 50 barrier then like then then you're and like even then the top 20 then you're starting to attract the kind of sponsors 
and you kind of make you you, you that you're kind of advertising their the, the sponsorship on on like squash TV, so that's that's when it starts, kind of make you can make a good living out of it at that kind of at that kind of point. Yeah, so I guess that's I guess a bit of a catch twenty two, right? So you you kind of need to devote more time to it in order to get yourself to that level, but then there's also the challenge of you know how do you sustain that you know from a from a you know put your I suppose from a financial standpoint ultimately. Is that is that kind of a the crux of it? Is that one of the big challenges for a for a professional squash player? Yeah, it is. It is very it is very challenging, and especially like not just from England, but from from countries all over the world where some government funding schemes don't even support squash and things like that. So it, it can be very hard for people to even kind of start out because like when you even start at the bottom of the rankings, there's six hundred people in them, and it's hard to even get into tournaments. You go away, you get to a tournament. You lose first round, you're getting like absolutely nothing. Then you're going back home again. So you kind of have to know that you've put the work in. You're doing well enough to actually go and give it a go and see how well you can do. If we look back at your career so far in the world of in the world of squash, what would you say is kind of your proudest achievements been? Proudest achievements have been European team champion under 19s winning with England against France in the final. Second has to be Dutch Junior Open winner under 19s. I was only six months off, so about eight months after I came back from an ankle, broken ankle injury. And and then in the professional world, I've won two professional satellite tournaments. And so those one of them was held in Estonia and the other, I believe, was in... Uh, England actually here so those kind of two titles help kind of push me up the rankings into a point where I can start getting into bigger tournaments. In that time already winning a couple of you know big tournaments is that kind of started to I guess like you said it's pushed you up the rankings and got you closer to the you know the the bigger tournaments, etc. Have you, have you, is it? I guess you made a bit of a splash then in the in the kind of squash world early on. Yeah, it's 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 hard because obviously you've got a lot of a lot of other players winning titles here and there, so the limelight can be on other players winning bigger tournaments than what you've done. But it's, you've got to kind of look at it from a personal kind of viewpoint as your journey, where you've come from, how how it's going, and for me. I'm I'm ha I'm happy with what's going on, how I'm progressing, and it's just a matter of kind of keeping that kind of steady progression and improvement, maintaining that kind of confidence that I can do, and just kind of keep pushing on, see how well I can do. Well, keep going at the pace you're going. It sounds like you're absolutely going to get to to uh, <laughs> some of those goals you set yourself. Absolutely. So, yeah. So what's the the next kind of big tournament for you? The next big milestone. So. At the moment, because of lockdown, it's very, they're very unsure when the talk's going to start back. However, last month I was meant to go to South Africa for three tournaments back to back. So that that was the plan to go there and see how well I could do because I really felt like I had a chance of doing well out there and kind of proving to obviously the people and like myself that I, that I can do well and win some because these were like slightly bigger events and see how well I could do. But but for now, the tour isn't meant to resume until September and they're still unsure whether how many tournaments are going to be back on and stuff. So it's it's really hard to tell at the moment. Yeah, I guess it's it's it must be really challenging for you right now just to keep yourself in, in kind of peak condition, ready for those tournaments, but also having the kind of the not knowing, the uncertainty of when's the next one going to be, right? Mm, mm, definitely. That it's 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 been super tough because you're 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 basically training but you're not knowing what to, you're training for and you're not knowing when when to be ready for. So you can't like you can't like taper off or look to peak for anything. You just kind of gotta maintain a good steady training system kind of training base and plan and then again the, the squash cots can't aren't even open so it's very limited as to what we can do yeah so are you finding you you know most of it's conditioning kind of work rather than sort of game specific training mm, yeah so for me it's a bit of a chance to try and maybe work on my like fitness and speed and like kind of strength 
like like you said, conditioning exercises and the little technical things that I might not get a chance to spend more time to work on. So it, 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 it has been a good time for me to work on some things I wouldn't normally get the chance to focus on. But it's obviously very frustrating not being able to do things you want to to make those improvements. Yeah, I guess so. And, and I imagine that the, the challenge being like, you know, not knowing exactly when when things are going to reopen, I, I guess there'd be a period of time where you need to get kind of match sharp again, right, before you'd want to go into one of those big tournaments. Definitely, yeah. Especially when you're coming, coming straight back onto a squash court, yeah. You, you've got to be careful and like slowly build build up back to kind of a match kind of pace and match kind of pace and play because it, it's going to take a while to get back up to what I was saying like March. Uh, so it's going to take some preparation and fine tuning to get myself ready again. Yeah, I'd imagine so. And and I imagine there's not a huge amount in a, in the training sort of sphere that can replicate it, right? Because there's such a mm. it's such a high intensity game. And then you add in the the mental element, I suppose, that you're going through when you're kind of thinking of what you're going to do next and all those snap decisions you're having to make. I guess it's very difficult to replicate that in training. Yeah, that's a really good point. It is it's super tough because the game's played at such a high speed. You've got kind of like minimal time to think about what to do. It's, it's, it's a lot of reaction-based play and stuff. So, like you said, at home now, it's hard to mimic those kind of situations. But we, you just got to make the best and most of what you can out of this time. So, like, I'll do certain practices. I'll make, like, like maybe like a wall where I can, like, practice a few shots here and there. And then, like, practice certain movements that I do on a court and, like, kind of replicate the rally length and then just trying, trying to build up that base fitness as best I can, really. Yeah, 100%. And do you have um, kind of like a coach that has to keep keep tabs on where you're at from a progress point of view just to make sure you're you're kind of hitting the 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 the, the milestones they want you to should play resume in september yeah so actually my my uh, coach is my dad sure and so it, it works it works super well so he's always <laughs> at home with me and <laughs> honestly it makes it super easy so can't avoid your coach though i guess that's the answer <laughs> no, exactly <laughs> holds you to account right that's, that's one thing yeah but <laughs> no it makes it super easy for both of us because we have a good understanding of what i'm doing what he wants me to do what i would like to do and things like that so it makes it kind of super easy especially being at home now because I'm, I'm seeing him every day whereas other players are probably struggling because they haven't seen their coaches or taught them for a while so i i, I obviously take that as a bonus for me yeah, huge. I mean, uh, let's let's hope you know that's a huge advantage for you when you come back. Because, like you say, I think there'll probably be a lot of athletes right now who are who are trying to fit in the odd kind of like a uh, Zoom session or FaceTime kind of like call to to <laughs> kind of uh, you know work out what their programming looks like, rather than getting the the benefit of of having their coach with them. You know, exactly, exactly. So that 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 is a big uh, benefit for me. And I'm, I'm obviously grateful for that and just make, making the most of it. That's super awesome. Well, look, it's, it's been great chatting with you, uh, Curtis. I've, re I've really appreciated it, uh, your time. Um, and, uh, you know, best of luck to you. I think you're, you're on an amazing path with your squash career and, uh, and, and, you know, more power to you for putting such a spotlight on your nutrition as well and i think you know the example you'll provide whether it be through the the squash clubs locally but hopefully on the on the world squash stage i think uh, it's going to be a great example to so many so huge huge thank you ah, you're welcome and thanks for having me on the on the podcast it's been it's been a pleasure talking just get get my viewpoint across letting people know what it's about like you said hopefully i can clump the rankings and make kind of my plant base kind of diet even more applicable for people as i kind of get a bit more on the spotlight very cool very cool let's hope so where, where would people go about finding you as well curtis online if we're uh if we're trying to seek you out so my instagram i have a personal account so it's curtis malik 1999 or you can follow me on my kind of plant specific page which is plant underscore power underscore nutrition and then 
I don't currently have a website, but I'm on Facebook as well. Just Curtis Malik. I have an athlete page on there as well. You can follow my journey as a kind of player, where I go, the tournaments, and all that kind of stuff. 100% recommend uh, those follows because your plant powered nutrition page on Instagram, just just the, some of the food ideas alone, you know, if you're, <laughs> if you're looking at uh, whole food plant based diets that are super nutritious and, and, uh, and obviously able to power uh professional athletes like yourself uh, and it's huge inspiration definitely for me so yeah huge thank you for that and i'd thoroughly recommend it thank you thanks so much and uh see you again Thanks.